Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, we'll talk about several debates held this week for state and national offices, and we'll look ahead at the governor's debate, which will be held Monday here on Arizona Horizon. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Bob Christie of the Associated Press. This week, Arizona Horizon hosted several spirited and at times heated debates for a variety of state and national offices. We'll start with the matchup for Arizona's first congressional district. And uh, Jeremy, this was both spirited and heated at times. Uh, that it was. Uh, both candidates were uh, really on the attack. You know, Tobin is a. Uh you know, use, use, using the traditional playbook, trying to tie Kirkpatrick to Obama and a lot of, you know, Obamacare, a lot of the more unpopular things that he's done. Obviously, this is a, inter, or a midterm election where the president's a party, the Democrats, isn't expected to do well. And, uh, you know, Kirkpatrick tried to present herself as a real centrist, real moderate, you know, somebody who could reach across the aisle on some issues, but she did stick with her guns on some of the liberal core issues, like yeah. Obamacare. Yeah. And, and what's important, of course, is that both of them have records. Now, you know, from Andy Tobin's perspective, you know, she voted to close Gitmo, which is going to mean terrorists are coming here to Arizona. <laughs> she responded that, well, you voted and shoved through Senate Bill 1062, which nearly lost us the Super Bowl. So both of them found themselves on the defensive and having to justify much more nuanced votes than they really were. Right. And she did the 1062 thing at two different times during the debate, which I thought, you know, that's that's an effective attack against Andy Tobin. He, you know, brought that bill. It came over from the Senate, and in 24 hours, it was on the way to the governor's office. And you know, he's got a. He's, she's going to try to hold him accountable for that. He's going to try to hold her accountable for the Affordable Care Act. Um, well, yeah, and that's interesting because she she didn't back down at all. Said, yes, it, it helps people in my district. Yeah, she said, you know, yeah, it's not perfect. You use some changes, but she really stuck with her guns on that. And it's kind of surprising if you remember her first term and her first reelect when she got defeated. She got a lot of flack from the left for really running away from the Democratic base on a lot of things. And you'd figure, you know, much like Kirsten Sinema or Ron Barber, you'd try to kind of hew as closely as you can to the center. But she seems to have decided that the thing for her to do is to kind of embrace the and, base and on a lot let, of issues. Let's, let's also talk about the fact that Obamacare doesn't have the sting it once did. I think a lot of people are saying, well, yeah, the world has not come to an end. In fact, the hospitals reported we're getting less uncompensated care, which means maybe we won't have to raise the bills for the people who can pay. And so for all the talks on how the whole place was going to going to collapse, it hasn't. Yet right. in the debate, in the debate, Tobin said that it's making finding a doctor harder and health care costs are rising. That's right. And she pushed back and says, well, you know, they're not they're not rising as much. And more importantly, she she pointed to a really critical part of this district, which is the, the Native American population. She said one of the things Obamacare did is made the Indian Health Service permanent, which is a huge deal in on the Navajo Nation and in the Apache Nation and elsewhere. And, and that's going to be a huge source of votes for Kirkpatrick. You know, Tobin had a poll you know, a couple of weeks ago that showed him up by about eight points. And the first thing that the Democrats said, look, pointed to as, hey, this vastly undersamples uh, American Indians, and that's going to be a lot of Democratic votes there. So how's this race shaping up? What are we seeing out there? Well, look, the fact is it is marginally now a Democrat district. Now, of course, we know rural Democrats, the quote-unquote pinto Democrats, you know, tend to, to skew <coughs> conservative. But Kirkpatrick has come back, and she's justified her existence. She's had some good advertising. You know, you know, these are, these are my boots I bought with my college savings. Well, kind of an odd moment there. It's an she... odd moment when she tried to put them on the table, particularly since you couldn't see the boots within the frame. But, but in her commercial, the same sort of thing, that she's come across as common sense. I've lived here. And then, of course, the zinger on the end, which is, if you want to talk about representative government, here's a guy who doesn't even live in the district and can't even vote for himself. That's not a bad going away line. Yeah, absolutely. In this district, and I talked to the House Majority Leader, Kevin McCarthy, the mm -hmm. congressman this, this week, uh, and they're pumping a lot of money into this race, the uh, National Republicans. <coughs> They've committed $3 million now to this race. Uh, RN, uh, Democrats committed a couple million, so you know it's competitive. Uh, Andy Tobin has had a real hard time fundraising, and Kirk Pickett has 1.3 in the in the bank. But what you might want to look at in this race is that last time, Kirkpatrick beat Jonathan Payton by three and a half percentage points. 
but there was a libertarian race who got 6%, and there's no libertarian this time around. Interesting. Yeah, I remember they passed a bill to try and uh, keep <laughs> such libertarians off, and turns out, at least in this district, wasn't necessary. Yeah. All right. So uh, as far as what you're seeing with this race, is it pretty much a toss-up right now? What are you thinking? That looks like, you know, six months ago, if you had asked me, and I would have said Kirkpatrick's dead in the water along with most vulnerable Democrats, you know, nationwide. But after that primary where, you know, you had Tobin and his two opponents, none of whom really impressed anyone. And, you know, as one uh, columnist put it, Tobin got dragged across the finish line <laughs> with about $300,000 in outside spending. I mean, he, I mean, he limped into that general election, whereas, you know, as uh, Bob mentioned, Kirkpatrick's just raising money hand over fist. Tobin's really struggling to raise money. And both national parties will spend a lot, but, but that probably cancels each other out. The national Republicans actually are running ads in joint ads with Tobin, which I think a lot of people are viewing as a sign of his uh, fundraising troubles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think she comes across very well. She presented herself very well in this debate. One-on-one, uh, -on -one she does okay. Looking at the camera in, in her commercials, she, she comes across. And I think that a lot of folks in the district say, you know, she's one of ours. And of, and of all the three competitive districts that we're going to talk about tonight, this one relies less on TV than the rest because of its vast nature and mm -hmm. it's, it's all rural. Um, I mean, Pinal County, of course, is not, but the rest of the yeah. district sure is. All right, Howie, we had the Corporation Commission debate. We had uh, basically <laughs> a, a team, uh, Republicans mm -hmm. uh, against Democrats. Got a little lively once APS was mentioned. Well, Actually got quite lively yes. once APS was mentioned. What was interesting is, you know, they, they all agreed, well, solar is good, although how much subsidy it should be. And, and for a while, I have to admit, watching the debate, I was, you know, saying, oh, my God, I don't have a story here. Until the question came <laughs> up about, you know, the Save Our State Now and the other outside funding. And the Democrats said, look, you know, our opponents here are basically being bought by APS, and that's who you want, and which, have, which led to Tom Fries saying, I'm insulted that, that anyone would say we can't get support without APS. Well, APS has issued the non-denial statement saying we're not saying we are and are not funding, but we've been attacked by the, the TELS uh, tell them solar won't be killed, the Tusk group. So we feel the need, if we have to, to defend ourselves. Well, and, and the Democrats, obviously, is how this, this is a major <clears throat> point, and they repeated that point. How much does it hurt the Republicans for APS to say nothing? Um, it could hurt them a lot. I mean, the, the problem for Tom Ferris and Doug Little is that, uh, and, and Tom was asked this, and I asked him this the other day when I ran into him, said, why don't you just stand up and say, don't spend this money for me, APS? And he said it during the debate. That would be coordination. I can't do it. Well, I don't know if anybody would ever uh, prosecute him for illegal coordination if he held a press conference that says, I disavow myself of this spending. I don't want them to spend it on me. Um, and it, for the voters, I think it, it puts out a pretty clear choice between the, that's the way the Democrats are framing it anyway. The Democrats are framing themselves as the consumer party, the, the people who will actually stand up for the consumers versus the big bad APS people. Yeah, you know, Faris very angrily proclaimed to this tale, you know, I, you know, I can't be bought, but if the Democrats can hammer that message enough, do voters really believe that politicians can't be bought? Yeah, well, can, A lot of them probably don't. And, uh, you know, even if you can't conclusively tie APS to this because of the non-denial denials, you know, mm -hmm. if everyone keeps saying it, you know, it'll, you know, you don't really have to prove anything. But the problem for the Democrats, this is so far down ballot, there's so little money they have on their side. Is anyone really going to be paying attention to that? You know, even, even with all the news coverage of you know, the APS, dark money and all that, is that going to be enough to really push and, and them over the finish line? that's interesting. And of course, you know, talk about if you, you know you've got a problem with your race. When, when the Arizona Republic wrote its editorial, they listed him as Gary Little instead of Doug, mm -hmm. which suggests that perhaps you're not exactly catching fire in terms of folks who know who you are. And right. you also had the Republic basically splitting the parties there right. as far as their endorsement, which is interesting. Which is actually, you know, when I uh, got done, when, when the debate was over, I sat back and I said, you know, if I was just judging, I'd say, um, actually, Little and... Uh, um, Jim Hallway, the Democrat. Um, the Republic came out and endorsed uh, Paris and in, in oh. Hallway. But I mean, just just the interaction of the of the four. That's what I would have walked away from if I had a, you know had a dog in the hunt. So is this? Do you still see this as Paris and Littles to lose? Pretty much. You know, once again, you know, down ballot race, Republican states. They've got the right letter next to their name, <clears throat> and the Democrats just aren't going to have their clean elections candidates. They just don't have the money to get that message out. And their message has gotten out a lot because there's been so much media coverage about dark money. 
but probably not enough to really well, sway the race. Well, the dark horse, of course, is what solar, what are the solar cities of the world going to do? Are they going to come yeah. in with a big IE themselves? Or, or the well, we already have seen that that Save Our State has come back with another message, you know, in favor of of Little Gary Little or Doug Little, whatever you want to call him. But but your point is right. But I think with a very little bit of money, you can send a very simple message. If you love what APS is doing to you, vote for the Republicans. And if you can keep hammering that home as a Democrat. That will make a big difference because every month between now and, and you know, there's going to be at least one more, maybe two more mm -hmm. utility bills coming in. You like your utility bill? Vote for them. So as far, as far as the debate is concerned, do you think the Democrats did enough to chip away at that? Probably not. And, uh, you know, like how I mentioned, if they could get some help, some outside help from the solar folks. But remember, the main group doing the, for the solar people is Tusk. Tell, tusk, tell utilities solar won't be killed. Name so because it reminds you of an elephant because it's a Republican group. Mm -hmm. And I haven't oh. spoken to them about this race. I remember asking them well, about the governor's race. Said, OK, well, Ducey won't take a position and Duvall supports your position. Will Tusk support him? He said, no, we're a Republican group. We're not going to support a Democrat. And that goes back to, 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 to your question, did they do enough? I would have, you know, I know you like people you're interviewing to actually answer the questions you're asking them. I would have said, that's interesting, Ted, but let me tell you about APS. And I would have <laughs> made every question, every answer about APS, about the utilities and who's buying them. They didn't hammer that home enough. Yeah, and we'll see if they uh, start hammering it home even more now as we get to the uh, finals. All right, another debate. We just had this one last night. Was it last night? They, they, debates are starting to, to roll all together. Uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, Kind of a curious debate here between uh, Garcia and Douglas. Talk to us about it. Well, speaking of uh, referring every question back to one particular issue, you know, obviously Diane Douglas is the anti-common core candidate. The Republican in the race is how she won, basically how she won the Republican primary with an assist from incumbent John Hoopenthal's own uh, <laughs> problems. But, you know, she views that as that race as a referendum on common core, obviously trying to make you know, the general election, the same thing. What's interesting about this is Diane Douglas has pretty much not been seen in public since that primary. She's there at the Republicans election, I think, and then she's pretty much disappeared from view unless you go to a lot of Tea Party rallies. Do we know why? Um, it feels like the general consensus that people feel like, you know, if, if she talks, she could only hurt herself. I mean, the Democrats are trying to paint her as an extremist. You know, seemed like a lot of people maybe didn't have a lot of faith in her abilities and yeah, after last night, I don't really see why not. I mean, it seemed like she handled herself fairly except well. Except when you get down to the details. For example, she talked <coughs> last night about state trust lands as a solution to the school funding problem. Well, I caught up with her afterwards, you know, because you didn't get time in the, the, the 24 minutes here to do that. And I said, now, wait a second. We've got 9 million acres, but you just don't put a for sale sign on it. There's, you have to have somebody who wants it. It has to be prepped. And then the other half of it, is that even if assuming you sell $100 million worth of trust land, that doesn't go to the schools, it goes to the trust, and the schools get the interest. It's, it, and it's, and she, <clears throat> it's those details, and she, literally, she so disagreed you, with me, and she walked away. So do you think that she takes complicated things like state land trust and tries to simplify them or sees them in a simple method, in a simple way? I think she sees everything back to we don't need, we need local control, we, uh, mm. we don't need... Uh, the federal government telling us how to teach our kids. We got to get rid of Common Core, and that's what she's based her. It's, that's what her thinking is about. So when we asked about school funding, or when she, you asked about school funding, she, you know, everybody has been bringing up this trust land, especially with this super. Uh, well, the Supreme and Court she lawsuit. didn't even have it. Her answer to you, as I recall, was, "Well, that's up to the legislature and the right. governor." Wait, you want to be the school's chief? You, your chief job is advocating on behalf of public education. So where do you stand in this? And yet, we've talked about this debate now for a few minutes. We haven't mentioned Garcia yet. <laughs> I mean, it, it, interesting? It, it, it is interesting. And uh, you know, he's been, the Democrats have placed a lot of hope in this guy. And, you know, came up fairly well. He, you know, like Douglas, he was dodging some questions, too. And, um, you know, he was very vigorously defending the Common Core standards. But, I, you know, and who doesn't like higher standards? But... You know, Douglas presented that, you know, in a you know, very accessible way, you know, you want the ivory tower, you want parents making the decision. And that's right. the key. And he didn't answer that. When you asked him, you said, if parents don't want this, are, is Common Core a failure? He says, well, I'm a parent, but then goes on to list educators <laughs> and business people who are for it, which proves her right. point that there is a divide in this state between parents 
and educators about these standards. But I think he did make a, make a good point, which is, you know, the, the point he kept coming back to was, listen, if we, if we just drop these standards, everybody else is going to pass us by. And, you know, everyone knows how fast technology is changing and everybody knows how fast the world is changing. If, if we just stop our standards, if we pull them back, we're going to be but, left behind. But she had an interesting answer to all of that. And this came up early that that somehow we've made schools with the whole STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, in into job training. And she said the message there is we're turning children into worker bees. And she wants, of course, more of the sort of three R. She wants civics well, but, and everything else. But don't else. you find that interesting? Because that, to me, is is traditionally been more of a liberal opinion in that get the well-rounded education, quit trying to, tr don't go to school for a job, go to school to become a smarter person who can read, write, and think. And uh, I don't think anyone's going to confuse Diane Douglas with a liberal. No, but, but it, this also comes down to a back to basics movement, but it also comes down to what we saw with the uh, press conference a couple of weeks ago by people like Steve Montenegro about you know civics tests and everything else and I think there's a feeling among the conservatives that kids do not understand the Constitution they don't understand Arizona history which is why she's emphasizing that okay so how's go ahead so when please. you talk about training you know kids for you know their future jobs you know parents care about education the reason they care is because they want their kids to get a good education so they can get into a good college and get a good job so it, it was kind of a bizarre exchange I thought <laughs> yes. right. so how's the race shaping up what are we seeing in this one well uh, I think uh, <clears throat> Garcia should have some slight advantage because of the backing he has he's got the chamber behind him he's got uh, he's lined up a bunch of, uh, of Republican former uh, superintendent of schools and, and he's got the moderate behind yeah. him but 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 Diane Douglas is you know it's a it, again it's a Republican Democrat race it's town ticket um, she's got a good chance and I'll tell you the other thing that he doesn't have so far and would make to be seen is will the chamber will the motor of the world come out with their own independent expenditures or contribute directly to him he needs the money he needs the ID you know she came across very well and you know so you're looking at a you know the the, the school marm former Peoria School District board member versus the Ivy League, Ivy Tower, you know, academician who teaches education at the Fulton School at, the, at ASU. You know, he needs somebody, he needs a business community out there to give the message they did during the whole Common Core debate, which is we're not hiring Arizona grads because they're not qualified. Well, and that brings us back to when we talk, and we're going to talk about this in a second regarding the governor's race. The business community kind of has a, a split allegiance here. They, they want Garcia in there because of Common Core, yet they're also backing, the chamber at least is, Ducey, who's not a big fan of Common mm -hmm. Core. I mean, that's... Well, well, in the governor's race, there's so many issues they mm -hmm. care about, and in the superintendent's race, there's pretty much one. But in the end, this is, as Howie said, this is going to come back to are they actually willing to pony up the money? Because they're not. I think Garcia's in some real trouble, you know. We, we've heard all year about what from Democrats, what a great candidate he is, what a great, you know, ground game he's got, field program. And he spent $200,000 for a relatively small win against a candidate who I think had about four grand and whose name we've already, for, we've already forgotten. That doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. All right. Uh, we did mention that uh, Monday here on Arizona Horizon we'll have our clean elections mm. uh, debate. And uh, we've had a couple of polls this week. Well, and oddly enough, the conservative-leaning poll shows Ducey ahead, and the Democratic and liberal-leaning poll seems to show it a toss-up. That's amazing. It is amazing, and that's one of the reasons I don't generally write about polls that uh, we haven't vetted. Um, uh, you know, we had some polling that came out right after the uh, right after the primary, about three weeks, four weeks ago now, that said uh, it's basically tied. And uh, the polls that came out this week from uh, the the Free Enterprise Club um, said. Uh, you know, Ducey's up by six. Wow, and amazing. A, and a lot of it is, you know, likely voters. What do you define a likely voter? Did you vote last time? Are, are you asking, are you likely to vote? A lot of this is going to come down in this race to GOTV, get out the vote. Whichever side can get their backers to the, not, not even to the polls anymore, because we saw what percentage voted early, but get them, follow up on them. Did you get your ballot? Did you vote it? And and that's what this race is going to come down to. I how close it's going to be? Look, we've got a, a you know a bunch of weeks before even the early ballots go out, and then you know uh, you know sitting here maybe November fourth and trying to figure out how it all shakes out. Um, hard to say. And then of course there are two other candidates in the race. Does Barry Hess take away from the Republican? Does John Mueller take away from the Democrat? 
you know, we're going to hear a lot more from them on Monday. Yes, and we will. Who knows? You right. may find each of them picks up 2 3%. That's a game changer. Uh, you, you did profiles of both major candidates, Ducey and, and uh, Duval. Not Hesser Mueller yet. But. <laughs> Not yet, no. Uh, but as, as far as you're seeing this shaping up, again, I keep using the phrase shaping up because these things, we're, we're, we're trying to get a narrative here. This one's a tough one. It is, and I think, um, you know, both the profiles that had kind of, I think kind of highlighted things that, uh, you know, the, the candidates and their campaigns and the parties will try to, to point out. You know, Duvall, he's been around public service, government service his entire life. He talked to me about how his first memories of, you know, political issues when he was like nine, ten years old, listening to debates about his father trying to get the College of Medicine started at the University of Arizona. You know, he worked for Babbitt through a couple of offices. He worked for Clinton. You know, Ducey's whole story is, you know, private sector. He got out of college, went to business school for Procter & Gamble and then set out and left because he was w looking for his opportunity. He wanted to do something entrepreneurial. He waited, for, you know, looked around for the perfect opportunity and found it. And I think that kind of, at least for the Republican side, that very much highlights their narrative. You know, this is a private sector guy yeah. and he'll kickstart the economy, as he as, likes to say. As far as how's the race shaping up, um, the, one of the things that I've been noticing over the last couple, three weeks, as, as they've done a couple of debates and as they've, you know, put out their press packets, um, is that they're both, as, as we would expect, moving towards the center. But, you know, um, Duval has taken a no new taxes pledge. He put out a jobs plan this week that included uh, um, more business tax cuts for small businesses and uh, a little thing called the Angel, Angel Investor Tax Credit, which the ACA really loves. So he's trying to get there. And, and Ducey has been talking about uh, education. He's been trying to steal... Duvall's big push. So they're both run. I mean, they're running headlong to the center as fast as they can. With that in mind, uh, for Monday's debate, what does Duval have to do? What does Ducey have to do? Well, Duval has to convince folks that he's not in there to raise their taxes. That while he wants to fund the 317 million, which he can do first year, obviously with the uh, rainy day fund, that he's not there to raise their taxes. That he's not some pointy-headed liberal. Uh, Ducey has to convince them that there's more to him than ice cream. Uh, you know, it's nice to talk about the business background. Obviously, Duval's going to be attacking him on you know, all the franchise <clears throat> operators who, who went belly up and everything else. Ducey also needs to do more than he, he's been described by a lot of people as, you know, these canned answers. Press one for my response on the economy. Press two for my response oh, here, here. On, on education. And there's the list of quotes that we can all recite. Yeah, the signature, you know, I've, I've built a company, now I want to shrink a government. And when you ask him, well, what do you want to shrink? He says, well, you know, I'm going to go through the budget line by line. But he's been treasurer for four years. He should know that budget pretty well. Uh, do we consider those evasive answers? I think they're not answers. They're, they're, yeah. It's not even an evasive answer. It is just, you know, I it's have, I, you, you should hire me because I'm a businessman and, yeah. I, and, and, and use and me he, as your CEO. He stays on script. That's what I'll say about him. He stays on script. And I've been to, uh, I, I went to <laughs> been to a lot of his events and watched a lot of his events that I wasn't able to attend. And, and it's even one-on-ones where he's got 10 people standing around and that's the script. Yeah, and most of the answers that both of these people are given are pretty much non-answers. You know, what you start to notice after a little while is there's very few specifics in, in terms of what their plans. It's more about philosophy and general direction. You know, Fred Duvall is going to invest in education. Doug Ducey is going to kickstart the economy, and he knows what's good for mm -hmm. business. But in terms of concrete plans, like Doug Ducey talks about, he'll fully fund the wait lists for charter schools. And I think he finally told Bobby the other day what that finally means because they didn't really have much of an answer. Well, for he me actually a said it at the debate when he was asked that question. He goes, "Well, you know, we have this thing, this education scholarship account, which is actually it's called." empowerment scholarship scholarship account which is vouchers so it, you know it, it seems like it, that's the only way you could do it I mean you're not going to go and build five brand new high schools next to the one that has a waiting list we got about 30 seconds left we want concrete answers we desperately yeah. try to yeah. get yeah. them at times um, what does the vo does the voter want more of that overarching philosophy kind of philosophical viewpoint maybe more than don't don't bother me with the details well, right now well, God help us the voters are going to vote on how they feel mm -hmm. about the candidates. And to a certain extent, a lot of the ads we're seeing, and not just this race, but all the races, is how do you feel about the candidates? And the candidate that, that makes voters comfortable for the, that they'll be happy for the next four years, that's who's gonna win. You're right. We like the details because we say, 
we're, we're providing something. But I think a lot of it's going to be based on all those commercials and all that feeling good stuff. All right. Well, we'll see what happens Monday evening. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, we do have a special clean elections debate for Arizona governor. An hour-long show will start at 5 p.m. The governor's debate Monday at 5 and again later that night at 10 p.m. right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.